Good evening and welcome everybody. I'm Stephanie Singer. I'm the manager of Arts and Ideas Lectures. And on behalf of the JCCSF, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Manival Conversations, Loaded, Jews and Money, and this evening's program, Jews, Money, and the Media, with Todd Gitlin, Daphne Merkin, and Matthew Iglesias, moderated by Mark Tracy. And now, please welcome to the lectern tonight's moderator, Mark Tracy. Mark is a staff writer at the New Republic, where he writes about sports and politics. He's the author, with Franklin Feuer, of Jewish Jocks, an unorthodox hall of fame. Mark will do the honors of introducing tonight's panel and getting the program off the ground. Please welcome him to the JCCSF. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Mark, as you heard. And uh, I guess I'll introduce uh, the panelists now. We have three. Uh, the first is Daphne Merkin. She's a New York-based cultural critic uh, and author. She's a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine, T, L, and Tablet Magazine. Uh, the second panelist we have is Todd Gitlin. Uh, he is a professor of journalism. Uh, he's a communications scholar. He's also a professor of sociology at Columbia. I can personally testify that uh, he's excellent at this. He was actually my professor uh, at Columbia about nine years ago, and it was an excellent class. And our final panelist is Matthew Iglesias. He is uh, Slate's business and economics correspondent. He writes a very popular blog. Uh, his most recent book is an e-book called The Rent is Too Damn High, uh, a sentiment that in San Francisco I'm sure many can identify with. And um, we, as you know, are going to be talking about loaded Jews and money specifically from something of a media angle. We're also kicking off this series, as you heard, so we're just going to also examine that phenomenon generally. So I guess I'd like to welcome the rest of them out here now. They're here. So, uh, to kick things off, I thought that we would discuss uh, the richest of Jews. Um, some, of, some of the richest of Jews uh, are very proud of this fact. There's a famous quote uh, from Sheldon Adelson. He's quoted in The New Yorker. He actually bragged to then-President Bush. This is not literally a direct quote, but it's basically right. Uh, quote, I am the richest Jew in the world, which at that time he was. Uh, he no longer is. Um, and uh, similarly, maybe not to quite the extent of Adelson, but a guy like uh, New York's mayor, Michael Bloomberg, uh, he's maybe not completely ostentatious about his Jewishness, but you, you pretty much know that uh, Michael Bloomberg's Jewish. On the flip side, you have someone like Mark Zuckerberg, who is most certainly Jewish and most certainly wealthy, but doesn't necessarily identify wholeheartedly. He, in fact, calls himself an atheist, uh, is an atheist. Um, and does not really participate much in the Jewish community. And in fact, currently, according to Forbes, uh, the richest Jew in the world is Larry Ellison, um, who's also probably well known in these quarters, um, who again was brought up in a you know, reform uh, childhood in Chicago, but is an atheist, does not really identify. And I guess the concept of an incredibly rich Jew um, who is not thought of or even known to be a Jew, if you posited that 50 or even 30 years ago, that would be, I would imagine, fairly inconceivable, like you would know. And so I guess my question is in that light, we're talking about how it's loaded um, to be, the, the question of Jews' money is loaded. Is it less loaded than it was 25 or 50 years ago? And, or is it not? And what are the implications of that? Whoever... I like think it's loaded. It occurred to me just this afternoon that 
I, I wonder if anybody's ever attended a panel on Catholics and money, <laughs> or, or animists and money, or Hindus and money, and, and, and whether anybody has ever proclaimed proudly, or proudly, let's say, I'm the richest Baptist in the world. It, there, <laughs> I, I think not, and, and I think that this is sort of one of the most endearing things about the Jews, that we have collectively a good deal of anxiety about the subject of money, which is partly built on uh, fear of uh, anti-Semitic canards, but also built on, I think, a certain tension built into being Jewish and a complicated relation to prosperity and obligation and 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 the question of what, is, what constitutes being deserving. I, I find it kind of remarkable that we're having this conversation in the first place. I find that maybe the most interesting thing about it. What did you guys think when you were first, when, when, when Stephanie called you and said, hey, I want you to do a panel, it's gonna be about Jews and money? It put me in mind of the gatekeepers. I don't know the documentary, if some of you have seen of the Shin Bet, the security forces in Israel, and the heads of the Shin Bet, and it's a very compelling and well done biography, documentary, but I had a similar question to Todd's, which is I thought would any other country put up their heads of national security to have a discussion about how they saw a similar problem, you know, some equivalent of the of the Palestinian problem. I mean, England has never thought to do it. And in some ways, I, I, I think there is some link to having a panel like this to a certain, not to sound too heavy handed about it, but a certain, there's a certain kind of moral masochism Jews specialize in, <laughs> um, in which they're, I think to their credit, um, there's much that, th that can be said to their non-credit, but to their credit, they are a group that questions itself, even though on the other hand, there is you know, self-censorship in that, but I think it partly comes, that's what I thought of, that mm -hmm. this is a very Jewish idea to have this conversation. So we're kind of like Shin Bet people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, there's sort of, I, I think, two kinds of people who take a, a sort of a purient interest in the question of who is and isn't Jewish among prominent people. And that's on the one hand, it's Jewish people. And on the other hand, it's, it's anti-Semites. And, you know, I find myself constantly, you know, sort of being kind of curious about whether or not somebody uh, is Jewish. And, you know, and my grandmother was the same way. And we used to kind of like sit around the table and debate various people. And there's, you you know, Adam Sandler's famous Hanukkah song mm -hmm. where he's just listing sort of prominent, prominent Jewish individuals. But then on a, a cab over here, uh, we were talking about are the are the Koch brothers Jewish? And so I, I went on my on my phone, as one does these days, and I start typing into Google, are the space K-O? And then Google's first suggestion <laughs> was, are the Koch brothers Jewish? <laughs> um, so obviously, the pe algorithm pe pe people are curious about this. Um, For the record, they're, they're actually not. And, 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 so, and so Mark says they're not, but if, if you Google this, what you find is essentially anti-Semitic conspiracy websites debating this and typically saying, saying that they are. And, and it actually comes up time and again. It's, it's incredibly difficult to research. Mm -hmm. You know, is Tim Geithner Jewish? But it doesn't um, have only to do with Jews and money. It has to do with Jews and achievement that fascination with who, to be fair, are they Jewish, are they not Jewish? I see people get very excited when some movie actor with a changed name that no one had thought was Jewish suddenly become, is revealed as Jewish. So I think it goes, I think the money part has a different, slightly different valence, partly because of our views of money, which are complicated probably never more complicated than now, it seems to me, in an age where there's so little discretion about money. I think, you know, money is fetishized, demonized, envied, um, looked at with wonder. It's so many things. And when you put together a subject that, that is that loaded and historically identified with Jews, for good and bad, 
I mean, Jews were forced to be money lenders. They were first, and, and you know, Jews were seen as, I, I actually mentioned to Mark that I wrote down a German proverb that caught my eye when I was reading a little bit for this evening, um, that Jews have been seen either as, you know, cheapskates or the leaders of the world's economic systems. They're like divided. Anyway, I was just gonna read this proverb, which is, these are the seven rarest things on earth. A man who does not sing, a girl who does not love, a fair without thieves, a billy goat without a beard, a hayloft without mice, a Cossack without the clap, and a Jew who isn't cheap. I thought it was quite amazing in its... You say um, it's a German proverb. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, we are here as also four members of the media um, who are Jewish and have probably, I can certainly speak for myself, dealt in, in our media dealings with other members of the media who are Jewish. I mean, I, I haven't crunched the numbers on this, but I'm pretty sure you'd find that in the media you'd find more than the roughly 2% of the U.S. population that's Jewish. Slightly more. Slightly more. Slightly more. Um, the, the old joke about Man Magazine, The New Republic, is that it's kind of a Jewish commentary. Um, commentary <laughs> being formally put out by the American Jewish Committee. Um, so I guess my question would be the, the, both the perception that Jews control the media, which is frequently proffered by anti-Semites, and the reality that there is certainly an outsized presence of Jews in the media, as we, as we say time and again, as we ask ourselves over and over, is that good or bad for the Jews? It's a given. I mean, Jews are overrepresented in the professions mm -hmm. and in certain levels of business, um, not usually in industry, but in finance, which has a historical root. But Jews are also overrepresented as lawyers and doctors. Uh, I don't know if anybody's crunched the numbers on whether producers in Hollywood are any more or less Jewish than than professors, let's say, or uh, journalists, or, or lawyers or doctors. Uh, but of uh, same order of magnitude and for the same reasons. I mean, I, that's not, I think, challenging. What, what is, I think, remarkable is that the fear of the Jewish cabal that runs everything has actually subsided. It, it, it interests me that some years ago, the, the Anti-Defamation League actually, which is, as, as we know, eager to find anti-Semitism, uh, commissioned a poll asking uh, people if they blamed the Jews for the financial collapse. And the finding was that people didn't, uh, which was sort of happy news for them, although I'm not sure how that would have played out in, let's say, Greece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did either of you guys in the, in the in sort of Occupy climate, um, I, I want to obviously come back to Todd about this. Todd wrote a book uh, called Occupy Nation. Uh, but did either of you guys sense that Jewishness, whether in media depictions or in terms of the whole finance thing, that that played a role at all? Because I gotta say, I remember my first trip down to Zuccotti Park, uh, probably within the first two weeks of, it, of Occupy starting in the fall of 2011, and seeing a cutout of Lloyd Blankfein's head on a right. spike. Lloyd Blankfein is the CEO of Goldman Sachs, which is actually the historically Jewish uh, investment bank. Um, did you guys sense that that element came into play? There were a couple of cranks who uh, showed up. I never saw them there. I saw photos of them, yeah. and uh, I don't know, capitalism is Jewish or some Wall Street yeah, is Jewish or something. And, and, and as soon as they cropped up, they were, they were surrounded by Occupy Park people who uh, were casting aspersions on them and, and sort of pointing the finger at them. One of the more uh, distressing pieces of bad journalism that I saw uh, was uh, written by Andrew Ross Sorkin, uh, a Times financial writer, on the anniversary of uh, September 17, 2011, uh, which was the, found, the, the moment of the encampment. Um, there was a guy down at Zuccotti Park for the anniversary who was parading around with a sign that said something like, uh, Wall Street is Jewish or something like that. As it happens, I was down there and I saw that guy um, but he was not in Zuccotti Park. In fact, he was on the outside of Zuccotti Park, out, fenced out, and I witnessed a, a, a near attack on him by, by Zuccotti Park occupiers. 
somehow Andrew Ross Sorkin got it through his head that this guy was representative of some sinister anti-Semitic current within Occupy, but it wasn't there. There, there were, there was, a, there was, there was a Yom Kippur service there. They carried a golden calf. Nice touch. Um, <laughs> Well, and you know, this is, this is a, a time, if you think back to, to 2009, to early 2009, you know, the winter, uh, real <laughs> sort of peak financial crisis sort of moment. And, and this is a time when the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States was Jewish. Um, the, the White House chief of staff was Jewish. The chairman of the National Economic Council was Jewish. The chairwoman of the Council on Economic you, you Advisors do check was these Jewish. Yes. I, I did, and it, and it actually it, it went quite far. The the president of the European Central Bank was Jewish. Uh, the head of the International Monetary Fund was Jewish, um, and I actually think that. Uh, you know, I, I came to believe at one point that there was, in fact, a Jewish media conspiracy to, like, not talk about this. It, it struck me as slightly remarkable that actually all of the key, not 100 percent, but, I mean, a, a really disproportionate share of the key economic policy positions were really being held by, by Jewish people. Um, and, and there really wasn't, a, you know, any kind of meaningful uh, conspiracy theorizing around that. And it was... Um, I think a, a little bit remarkable. I, 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 I felt good, but also sure. I mean, you kind of wanted to get out there and fight. Um, and at the same time, though, I do hear from people who work in the financial industry, and they feel like the industry itself is under attack these days. That's their mentality, is that there's a, a siege on Wall Street. And, and some of them will say that they think that anti-banker sort of banker sentiment is a kind of an anti-Semitic notion, and that that's why people feel bad about, about Wall Street or, or about the banking sector. Others might say it's because we had a financial crisis. But I think this... <laughs> no, you brought up earlier, Mark, Jews in the media. One thing I've discovered through my own work life is that Jews actually in the media tend to downplay their Jewishness. I worked at the um, New York Review of Books, whose Editor Bob Silvers, aside from the fact that he had a name that um, was clearly Jewish, that was the furthest thing. He was, I came from an Orthodox background, so he was utterly fascinated that I kind of either believed, I'm not sure how much I believed at that point, but that I had been brought up, brought up in, I don't know what his own background was, and also when I worked at the New Yorker the first time around, um, which was many, many years ago, thus dating myself, there was a typing pool, if you can envision <laughs> such a thing. And I was in the typing pool. There were about five or six women. Um, and two of them from the South said to me, at that point I was still, I left early on Friday. But it changed depending when, when sundown was. And the New Yorker was a bastion of closeted Jews from William, William Sean on down. So these, and Passover was coming. And these two young women said to me, you know, are all Jews rich? Because don't you need a third set of dishes? So I said, well, actually, if you're observant, you need two extra sets of dishes, Federian and meat, but they can also be paper plates. But it was interesting to me. They came to me with the question, with such sociological assurance, that this spoke for. But you, but you said, I mean, if we're, it was a typing pool, presumably this was, and if it was Mr. Sean's New Yorker, presumably it was some years ago. And it sounds like what I'm hearing from you guys is that it, it, it's a little less fraught uh, for Jews, um, whether in finance or in media. Um, in terms of their Jewishness, it's, it's a little less of a burden than perhaps it was. Well, the gaffe, that, uh, uh, with respect to the question of Jews in media, it, it suddenly strikes me that the gaffe of the year on this subject was, was Ruta, Ruta, mm, Rupert Murdoch's notorious oh, yeah. tweet. Um, does right. anybody remember, the, remember it verbatim? What exactly um, did so he What's say? wrong with the, the Jewish, Jewish media? Why are they beating up on Israel or something? Like right, that. Yeah. that was it, basically. And of course, you know, He's People not. had to explain to him that you're not allowed to do that. But I, I mean, uh, I mean, I think he he's out on many limbs simultaneously. That was yet another one. 
Um, I don't. I don't recall any tremendous, re you know, recoil of of defensive indignation on the part of the Salzburgers, the Grahams, and all so on. Like, okay, there goes Rupert again, and <laughs> you know, no need to pay much attention. Well, his Twitter feed is sort of notorious. Uh, his Twitter Twitter feed is uh, Rupert Gift. Yes. So you should definitely follow as you're as you're live tweeting our panel. You should also follow Rupert Murdoch on Twitter. It's an experience. Um, if I can shift the conversation slightly, because we've been, we've been talking a lot about non-Jewish perceptions of Jewish control of media, Jewish control of finance, or lack thereof, or imagined, whatever. Within the Jewish community, there's also a fraud issue of money and, um, and you know, a sort of very uh, ambivalent attitude towards achievement, and achievement is manifested by money. And one solution that some see to that um, is philanthropy, you know, I, you heard that this panel was made possible in part by some presumably uh, affluent and, and generous um, and presumably Jewish donors, um, and that's not an uncommon thing at all at a Jewish community center in an American city. Um, what do you guys make of Jewish attitudes towards Jewish philanthropy? Is that also a loaded well, topic? I know. Well, yeah, I worked for a publisher named Bill Yovanovitch at a publishing company called Harcourt Brace Yovanovitch. And one day he said to me very suspiciously, what's behind your father's philanthropy? With a sense that the philanthropic instinct, I think coming from a Jew, was my real feeling, had to be compensatory or somehow covering for some I don't know, what's, would he have said what's behind your father's philanthropy to someone not Jewish? But then there's also the fact that Jews are, um, by and large, fairly philanthropic. I, I've read some report that younger Jews are less so, which doesn't seem... We have less right. money. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe one reason. Um, um, I think Jewish philanthropy through the ages, or, or I think it, it got set up in a sort of systemic, systemized way, I believe in Germany in the 1800s. Um, I think it's always had enormous weight in the community, honor. Again, one could argue with some of this compensatory, and there's also the question to be asked, you know, do you make a lot of money and then you repent? and you become charitable. So it's, well, that, that is that what you mean by compensatory? That it's sort of like this is, your, this is the wage you pay for making so much money that you give some of it back? It's one way of establishing character, I would say. Mm -hmm. But this is not a new story, uh, certainly in the, in the history of American uh, capitalism, uh, the, the, those non-Jews, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Fords, the Fricks. Okay, they so all had money much earlier than Jews, and I think Jewish philanthropy, philanthropy stands out even in America. We were talking about most hospi many hospitals are Jewish funded. Um, I think it is proportionately large, is my sense. Well, I mean, one could say that it's compensatory, one could also say that it actually is in Jewish tradition that the, a Jew has a higher purpose. This is the very, it may be, the, the message may be obscure and, and God is not quite explicit to Abraham about why he's been chosen, but, but there is this root of the Jewish identity which is that you are you are in this not necessarily because of any personal quality. Somehow, for some right. reason, you've been chosen, and so it would follow then that you have to deliver something in order to prove it. And I think that this is, the, right. is a philanthropic... Impulse. And Jewish yeah. law, frankly, I'm never sure, is tithing a tenth? Yes. I believe so. Jewish law has maser, which is a tenth. You give a tenth of your... Um, of your income. 
one, one place in which it, it gets tricky, though, is that in the, in the structure of the American political system, there's sort of a, a fine line between philanthropy and, and influence peddling. Uh, you know, I, I live in, in Washington, D.C., been living and working there for, for a decade, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nonprofit organizations in Washington that I'm not sure you would necessarily call charities in a, in a traditional sense. They're, they're advocacy groups, they're trade associations, and then, of course, there's political campaigns, they all have different, different tax statuses. Uh, but Jewish people are, are a very disproportionate share of a lot of that money that comes into the political system. It comes in on different sides. I mean, we were talking about Shel Nadelson, who was a, a huge donor on the Republican side, but it's really uh, Democrats, you know, get a, a huge amount of their, their money, really, from, from Jewish donors because. Jews tend to be Democrats. Uh, Jews are more affluent than many of the people in the Democratic Party. Uh, but that, you know, I, I think most people think of political giving as it's often looked askance at. Uh, but the people who do it, you know, they like to think of themselves as being very high minded. Um, and it's not something that I think, you know, you always know exactly how to discuss it in the right way. It's not always obvious what's really going on when people sort of give in that way. But there's also a lot of philanthropic giving within the Jewish community itself. That doesn't, I don't think, I mean, certainly among, um, again, I come from an orthodox philanthropic family, most of the money was given to Jewish hmm. causes. Well, be before we leave Mr. Adelson aside, um, uh, it's, it's interesting, there is an asymmetry here because Adelson very closely identified with a political line of argument and, and, an, and a nation state which he devoutly believes in, namely the state of Israel, where he's not only a big donor, but he's a mocker. Mm -hmm. He runs a newspaper. Mm -hmm. He runs a major newspaper. The, right. the best, the widest, most widely circulated the most newspaper. most widely circulated. It's a free, it's a giveaway newspaper. Israel Hayom, is it's called? Israel Today. And you know he's a player. So whereas it's very interesting, uh, George Soros, who might be thought of as equivalent on the left, is steadfastly uh, disdained giving to media. Yes. He gives to universities. He gives to human rights organizations. He gives to electoral reform and so on, drug reform, all kinds of causes. Stays strictly away from media. Mm -hmm. But it's the same way if you think of, say, uh, the New York Times is, is not a charity, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's a family-controlled business. It's a Jewish family. I think the general understanding among everyone is that they could, you know, sell it out uh, and make more money than they make owning it, but it's seen as a, as a, as a trust, as some kind of a, a public service and a public responsibility that they're doing and it's it's in some ways it's an act of charity i mean it's probably the the greatest newspaper in the world it does invaluable stuff but it is also a way of becoming you know players and, and influential people in, in the american scene and it's i think you can't you can't de-link charitable influences from you know a desire for uh, a certain kind of social power mm -hmm. right no I, yeah i don't quite see enlarging, elasticizing the scope of what you call a charitable impulse or organization with a newspaper or even a nonprofit group. I mean, I think there's a distinct, a newspaper, however, I don't think that, you know, the Times isn't selling out out of some greater good feeling whatsoever to the extent that I know people <laughs> at the Times, they don't strike me as selfless, but, um, so in that sense, I don't see that as an example of a charitable cause. But I guess what I'm saying is but that all charities... It's specific, you know, though. It's, 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 yeah, it, that's it, a larger and, and, delineation. And when, and when people decide they want to give some of their money away, you, know, you never see them kind of walk down to the bank get like a wheelbarrow full of hundred dollar bills and just kind of, you know, roll it down to that, that block with all the SROs and sort of, you know, hand it out to people, right? I mean, they set up foundations or they give it to institutions and then get their name on the wall, right? So there's, I mean, there's a real charitable influence when, when people are giving money away, but overwhelmingly they do it in a way that they retain some control True. over what happens and people need to, you know, cater to their whims and, and their wills uh, to, to one extent. Although the highest form of charity, Jewishly, is, Hillel, is right? anonymous giver and anonymous recipient. Yes. Wow. 
Which brings to mind the uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm episode where <laughs> Ted Danson gets all the accolades because he gave the money anonymously. And anyway, I guess none of the people have seen that one. Good episode. Um, you know, we're talking about the sort of intersection of of Jewish philanthropy on the one hand and Jewish interest peddling on the other hand, you know, giving money in order to receive a desired political outcome. And it strikes me that the place where those two things converge is in fact Israel. And Matt, Matt is absolutely right, just empirically, that by and large, Jewish donors in America um, and wealthy Jewish donors in America are more Democrat, more, more Democratic than Republican, more likely to be Democratic than Republican, it's just the sheer numbers. I do think, however, in terms of um, donors both to Israel and for uh, pro-Israel causes, they tend to be a little more conservative, even if they're Democrats, in fact. In fact, especially if they're Democrats. I, um, I used to work at Tablet, which is a magazine of Jewish life and culture, and I remember I was talking to a prominent Jewish Republican donor, and I asked him if he was coming to the APAC conference, and he said, no, why would I want to be in a room with 15,000 Democrats? The fact is, Jews, you know, even pro-Israel, even you know, hawkishly pro-Israel Jews tend to be Democrats because of issues like abortion and because of uh, issues like you know, even tax policy. So I'm wondering in terms of uh, Jewish giving that affects um, both Israel, American Israel policy and also Israel. I mean, if you go to Israel, so many buildings have English names on them because it's uh, Amer American uh, donors. Um, is, that, is, that, is that philanthropy or is that influence peddling? And well, that's an interesting question because there, there are at least two prominent wealthy American Jews who are deeply involved in the occupation of the Palestinian territories and the support of them. Sheldon Adelson, I already mentioned, one of the major builders on, in East Jerusalem and on the West Bank is a man who, whose name, I believe, is Ir Irving Moskowitz mm -hmm. um, from Miami, who lives yeah. in Florida. He's a doctor, made piles of money. And there is something curious here. I don't know what to make of it, and I don't want to I don't want to say this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an insult or an accusation, but it is curious to me that both the fortunes, the Adelson and Moskowitz fortunes, were built on gambling. Uh, Adelson is a, is a tycoon of uh, gambling casinos. He doesn't seem to have had any compunctions about working out a very intimate deal with the Chinese communist government to enable him to open casinos in Macau. And Moskowitz is, Moskowitz is the bingo king of Florida. So, he really? Uh, yeah, yeah, he really is, yeah. So, uh, um, look, look it up. <laughs> so, and he's Jewish. Uh, so, I don't know what to make of that. But um, anyway, the, you know, these folks are not simply philanthropic. They are, uh, they have a political view and they're putting their money and their properties where their mouths are. But no one is ever simply philanthropic. That happens to be an agenda you may not agree with, but George Soros isn't purist, puristly philanthropic either. He has agendas himself. I don't know that, actually. Give, give money to Mount Sinai, give money to Maimonides in Brooklyn. How is that not just philanthropic, or a hospital? I guess you're getting a, a sort of... Well, if you're giving money to a... A Jewish. Shabbos <laughs> elevator in Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. or as my, or kosher kitchen. Mm -hmm. That certainly has Orthodox Jewry in mind, right. which could be said to be an agenda, as much as, I'm always surprised there aren't more prominent Jews actually on, that, on the uh, supporting building in the occupied territories. Not that there are those, so few, well, you know, I, that, we, that's we, an empirical question. I actually don't know how many others there are. Well, those are the main two. Yeah. We, we, we had, obviously, a, a substantial controversy around uh, Senator and now Secretary uh, Chuck Hagel's characterization of, of the Israel debate in Washington, where he had said at one point that, that members of Congress are intimidated by the Jewish lobby. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was a problem for him because that's not, that's not what you're supposed to say about it. Um, at the same time, I thought it was interesting that it, it, I feel like it wasn't as big a problem for him as it would have been in the past, almost because American Jews feel so secure 
in our position here, that people are not really sitting on the edge of our seats thinking that an anti-Semitic cabal is gonna take over the Defense Department. So people are happy to say, you know, look, I mean, we understand what he meant, and some people, you know, don't like President Obama's administration, but most Jewish people voted for Obama twice. And, and I went to the, uh, the APAC conference, well, I didn't actually go to the conference, but I went nearby it and, and spoke to people. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was a, it was a sad moment for Jewish Republicans, I think, because you had these people, people very invested in the Israel issue, very invested in from a, a hawkish viewpoint, uh, more, more hawkish than mine, and, and what they said to me about Chuck Hagel was, you know, well, I didn't like what he said, but if President Obama says he's okay, you know, that's, that's good enough for me. Um, and, he's and then, been kosher, you yeah, might say. Yeah, but I mean, but he was kosher, but I mean, it's exactly, like Jewish Republicans saw it the exact opposite way, that here we had, you know, the, the real Obama, right? I mean, this, this Kenyan radical with his uh, uh, anti-Semitic defense secretary. Um, but, but most Jewish Americans don't, don't see it that way. Uh, but that becomes a, a huge strand of influence. I mean, in a way, if Jews in America were more conservative on, you know, abortion questions, gay rights questions, basic economic questions, then they would be in the Republican Party, and that would change the foreign policy debate a lot. But it's right. having a, a sort of a large block of Jewish liberals, you know, is what gives the, the bipartisanship to the Israeli. It was, it, was, it was the Emergency Committee for Israel, which is a... As its name, it's you know, it's in fact basically a Republican group, but obviously nominally their chief concern is Israel. They actually ran ads about the guy down at Zuccotti Park, um, the the Occupy uh, guy, saying, you know, this proves that Occupy is anti-Semitic and is, uh, you know, not to be trusted. Well, actually, it raises an interesting question. Um, a commentary, among others, um, at the very beginning of Occupy Wall Street, uh, pointed the finger at ad busters. Mm. Uh, the Canadian magazine, which had called for an occupation uh, near Wall Street on this particular date, there were others, but they were the most conspicuous, and it was noted accurately that a number of years ago, uh, ad busters ran a really repellent uh, piece uh, saying, you know, there's a dark secret, people, about the neocons, they're Jews. And, um, sorry, I've lost my ability to speak here, I'll just hold this. Um, and in fact, I, I, I remember that Ad Busters article, I found it disgusting, and, and I actually wrote them a letter saying, you can never publish me again. But, um, so, you know, yes, it seemed evident that the publisher of, of Ad Busters was, or had been, at any rate, a flagrant anti-Semite. And yet, then the issue went away. I mean, I'm sort of, I was frankly fearful that this would metastasize quickly because it was sort of a, an easy shot and yet it did not have legs. I thought I read a lot about, at that time, about conservatives being Jewish. The whole, the thinkers behind it, remember Paul, I'm forgetting his last name. Yes, the Wolfowitz. Oh yeah, yeah. There was, a, there was stuff going around about sure like years earlier about Elliot Abrams. Well, and I was in, I was in, uh, in England at, at one point, uh, you know, this is a, around 10 years ago, and there was a, a New Statesman cover story, and it, it, the, the tagline there was a kosher conspiracy, question mark, mm -hmm. and, you know, it was like, it was a list of all the, the Jewish people, uh, actually not U.S. neocons, even, it was Jewish people in the Blair government. So, uh, but actually, the there were actually ones. many more Jews in the Thatcher cabinet. cabinet. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the thing, though, if you're the media, um, one, one of the cardinal sins of that Ad Busters uh, article, to my mind, was they actually misidentified <laughs> uh, Robert's relic uh, as Jewish. He, in fact, is neither a neocon, really, frankly, nor, as a matter of fact, a Jew. Um, but, I mean, you're faced with whether it's control of finance in the wake of Occupy, where, you know, the, where the, uh, the titans of finance are not people who are uh, liable to be looked on um, with good eyes by the public, or you're looking at the neoconservatives in the run-up to the Iraq war, um, and it's an empirical fact that a highly disproportionate number of these people are Jews, um, and maybe even, you know, in the finance thing, you know, we can talk about the historical basis for that with the neoconservative thing, maybe uh, support for Israel, which in turn comes, comes out of their Jewishness is related to that. 
you know, those are relevant facts. And if you're in the media as we are, you want to be able to write about those facts and report those facts because that's, that's your job and you're doing a disservice to your readers and your profession if you don't do it. How do you, how do you guys struggle with, on the one hand, speaking frankly and factually about the stuff and on the other hand not lapsing into well, one thing you point out is that yes it, it was certainly true that a disproportionate number of the people who made the policy of the iraq war were jews but so is a disproportionate number of the people who organized against the iraq war That's, but uh, i think you come up against a more basic psychic conundrum of jewish identity which is are you proud to be a jew are you embarrassed to be a Jew? That's a kind of, and depending, I think <clears throat> that's somewhat where the media part fits in. Mm -hmm. That I think at its base, Jewish identity is somewhat fissured with a sense of, um, I mean, this notion of what will the Goyim think, I don't think has ever gone away with probably very good reason. Um, and I think that's part to do with a certain, you know, that partly explains a certain amount of Jewish self-censorship as you, you know, experience, like, how can you be writing? It has more psychological, historical roots. It's not only Sheldon Adelson and his ilk, but it goes back a long way. Well, this is an old problem. And, and I, I think, again, I think it's one of the most endearing quality of the Jews that Jews wrestle with this and argue right. about it and are fret about it and aren't sure where the line is. And then uh, and it becomes a contestable matter, which I think arguably, I mean, I mean, there are some people who say you, you shouldn't even have the discussion about whether to have this discussion because that's <laughs> right. bad for the Jews. Right. But I think those people are on the defensive now. And of course, it's been pointed out many, many times by the Jewish left in this country that, of course, the debates in Israel about all these things are far more vigorous, far more noisy, right. or even, you know, Which is exactly the point. No one has to feel insecure about their Jewishness or worry about what the, the goyim are going to think in Israel. Well, that's true. Yes. But, there's a, but there's a general, you know, there's an ambivalence in, in the American Jewish community about Jewish success and what to say about that and what to make of it. And, it, it, you know, money is one of the main currencies of success. But I, I remember I, I, was at a, I was at a book talk and it was about this book that came out a, a few years ago called Startup Nation, which was about Israel and the sort of Israeli tech scene. And, and I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself silently, I was like, you know, I have like a really obvious question about this. Because uh, the guy's going on and on about like Israeli policy toward the technology community, but I didn't want to ask my question. And, and I was really glad what, what some other old crank did. And was like, well, you know, it's a country full of Jews. Like, what do you expect? Like, is it, is it really that surprising that they have a lot of successful companies? And you know, and I, I was... <laughs> I, I was so glad that it wasn't me who, who asked that, but also it was, <laughs> you know, it was right at the front of my mind. Like, was there really a public policy miracle here, right? I mean, that um, the, the per capita income in Israel is much, much lower than the per capita income of Jewish Americans. Uh, but it's fairly high by, by global mm. standards, but low by global Jewish standards. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Um, I think when you're dealing with Jewish money, you're also not so discussed, but I recently, um, among my varied interests, wrote a piece for the Times about an antiques dealer. And I don't know if he directly said it, he referred to a style as, I saw he was sort of stumbling as Rococo Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> the notion, the fear, um, I always, my mini translation of this is many years ago I was looking for an apartment in Manhattan and every apartment, it wasn't so many years ago, I looked at that, I, that didn't have air conditioning, I knew couldn't belong to a Jew. <laughs> I just knew it. I mean, they were wasp, it was a wasp end of the city. And I think of a fear of being perceived as pleasure-loving, vulgar, all that goes along with Jews and money, and it's part of the picture. But wait a minute, aren't Jews supposed to be cheap? Yeah. That's one half of it. 
it's, it's, the, the, the way I've heard it is that uh, the, the Jewish guy is the guy on the tennis court with the most expensive racket uh, using used balls. Used balls. <laughs> <laughs> hey. We'll pay for things that are worth it, in other words. <laughs> um, well, um, I mean, there's no equivalent of the expression Jap in any other culture. I mean, just putting it quite bluntly, there are a presumably, you know, lavished upon high spending um, wasps and Catholics. I mean, you don't, that's, it's, it's interesting. But you would, would you say that that term is primarily, obviously it's descriptive of Jews for those uh, not aware, Jap would stand for Jewish American prince or Jewish American princess. You know, it's actually, I think, more often Jewish American princess. In my experience, male Japs are actually far more flagrant uh, offenders than uh, I've than never heard Japs. it used for boys. Oh, yeah. I, I knew we this is the a, new, more egalitarian the, you're gonna, America. You're camp with Islanders. The new um, metro, metrosexual Jew. Uh, Jew. Um, but, but you would say that that's a term primarily deployed by Jews. Yes. Yeah. In my experience, that's the case. Maybe, so, maybe non-Jews so, don't say well, it. Well, right. this, you know, this is an old ambivalence. I mean, I'm thinking here about you know one of the one of the worst anti-Semitic screeds of of the of the early 19th century was written by Karl Marx, uh, who used Jews as uh, as a surrogate or a um, uh, sort of a. a, 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 a yeah, a surrogate for capitalism, right. um, and and thought that you know Jewishness was improper. What you know, and it's it's a it's an awful book, uh, but it also you know it has to be said that there, what one thing that's inside this is uh, the ambivalence about universalism, which mm -hmm. is built into Jewishness. That is, Marx wanted people to put aside their feeble, pathetic, meager, parochial, local, national identities, workers of the world unite. Uh, so uh, this, I mean, it's, a, it's an old problem. You know, are the Jews, I mean, it's a very deep problem, I think, in the, in the foundational identity of the Jews, because the Jews are a particular people chosen by God to be the, the, the chosen people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very big deal. They're not just, you know, a bunch of nomads living, you know, in, you know, moved out of Mesopotamia into the Middle East. They are, they are God's people. Therefore, they're not simply a tribe. So this ambivalence, I think, is built in, and it's, uh, it would be a terrible mistake. I mean, one thing I detect again, to go back to people like Adelson, um, is that when they defend Israel. They defend something that is, by definition, singular and 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 um, uh, final. I mean, I, I, I one article I read about him ha uh, quotes him as saying, "I really don't care what happens to Iran. I am for Israel." Now, to me, this is a profoundly un-Jewish way of seeing the world. Um, there is something in the book about strangers and making them comfortable and, and, and so on. Uh, but I, I was at a conference of, of a couple of years ago with some quite prominent American Jews, one of whom said, and everybody in this room would know his name if I identified him, uh, said, you know, the real problem, this was in, in, the concept, in the context of a conversation about Jews and money, actually. Uh, he said, uh, he said, Everybody, uh, he said, we made a big mistake in American Judaism by emphasizing this notion of tikkun olam, this notion that Jews have an obligation to the world. He, he thought the Jews should be strictly tribal. Well, obviously that's not the prevailing idea, and, and the refusal to make that the prevailing idea is, I think, fundamental to the whole Jewish project. Does anyone in the audience have any ambivalent questions about uh, all this stuff? If you're, si if you're sitting in the middle of, oh, of a there. row, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to come out. Um, that would be great. Um, when I think of uh, Jews in the media, I think of Hollywood. 
And we haven't talked about that tonight, and certainly there's a perception that's probably true about the preponderance of Jewish people in, in important positions in Hollywood. So I'd like to ask the panel to reflect on um, Hollywood and portrayal images of Jews in movies, even television, Jews and money. Well, uh, my, my father is a, a screenwriter, as it happens, uh, among other things. Um, and, and, you know, he was doing, I, I remember he, he told me, uh, this was a, a while back, but he, he wrote a script that was an adaptation of, of a book of his, uh, you know, movie is called Fearless. And um, one of the scenes in it was set, um, I think it was supposed to be at a, at a Passover Seder. Um, and, you know, he got notes back on the script from the producer and was like, well, can we, can we change that? Can we make it like Thanksgiving or something? <laughs> and, you know, and my dad said back to him, well, you know, I mean, it's the wrong season. Um, <laughs> you know, I just said it was spring. <laughs> it was spring, fall. Uh, and, and, I mean, you, you know that. And because the, the, the producer is also Jewish. And, you know, it's like they're... I don't know that it's, it's all Jews, but I mean, a, a lot of Jews there, but there was an enormous reluctance to sort of portray a character as Jewish when he didn't, he didn't have to be Jewish. You know, I mean, it's not like the movie wasn't Schindler's List or something. It was just that my father is Jewish, and so he wrote a character named Max Klein, and so he wanted him to be having, he needed a family gathering in the spring, so they made it a Seder, uh, but they didn't, like, they, they didn't want to do right. that. except I was actually on a tablet sponsored panel, panel about Jews in the movies. And I think we all agreed that um, Barbara Streisand was the first sort of ethnically identifiable, acceptable Jew Jewish character who was, you know, there was little effort to soften, but that was fairly late. I would say yeah, there, there was an early, I'm sorry, there was an earlier period. It, it, I, I once studied Hollywood, uh, television Hollywood. Uh, it, it, there were, when television sets were relatively rare and, and, uh, and they were located in largely urban middle class households, you could have a popular show called The Goldbergs. Right. And that was in the 50s. But once you got past, in the 60s, when television was in every living room, yeah. No, 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 nobody wanted to do that. I mean, you know, every, Norman Lear has talked about this publicly, I think. You know, Archie Bunker was his father. I mean, his, that, that's who he designed. That's, that was the foundation of his, uh, uh, of his idea of Archie Bunker. But Archie Bunker was a wasp, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I, I was struck, I, I was working on this book about, about uh, television in Hollywood at a time when Hill Street Blues came along. And, and it was, I believe, the first cop show where there was, act, you know, where there was a, a, a cop named, what was his name, Goldblum, or? I can't well, even remember. I can't that. remember his name either. The, uh, the one played by Joe Spano. Mm -hmm. I mean, so yeah, you're right, there is this squeamishness. I'm always amazed. A lot of them are converted to Italians, <laughs> by the way. Uh -huh. I'm always amazed with all the reality shows and HBO shows, I once suggested to HBO that they should do a show on, you know, a Jewish family. It's in a way strange they haven't. Um, following, like, you know, that there'd be a great-grandfather grand, great who would be a patriarch and observant, and then a less observant, and show the generational does anyone Decline remember? Of legacy. Does anyone remember Brooklyn Bridge? Am I the only one who watched that for 20... 20 odd years ago, same guy who did Wonder Years, and it is oh, that's kind of like that. Um, it's, it's Brooklyn in the 50s, and you have the grandparents who, well, they're in, maybe not from the old country, but I remember Joel Gray had a recurring role as like the uncle who was a Holocaust survivor. Then you had the parents who are, you know, they're actors and actresses you'd recognize who are trying to assimilate, and then you have the kids who, you know, one of them's dating a red-haired Catholic girl, and. Oh. Wait, it just occurred to me, going back to your point about Barbara Streisand, what about Woody Allen? He's later. She, she predates Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Another question. Of course, his name is Woody Allen, not... Right, not Eric Schwartz. Konigsberg, right. his real name. Right. 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 For a uh, glimpse of uh, how things were uh, before we got rich, uh, <laughs> read uh, 
a book of about a century ago, Michael Gold's Jews, Jews Without, Without Money, Money which uh, depicts the generations, maybe four generations ago, when uh, hundreds of thousands got off the boat and landed in the tenements. But what happened? Because, I mean, the, their descendants, and they and their descendants now have money now, and how, how do you, I mean, how did that happen, and what does it say that, I mean, I, I've, by the way, I mean, that book's apparently a tremendous uh, book, and I've definitely, it's been on my reading list for a while, but I mean, I, I find it's interesting that, you know, that's true of a lot of immigrant groups coming r at roughly the same time. It wasn't just Jews coming to L Ellis Island, and yet now you do have disproportionate Jewish wealth. Is that just, is that just the Jewish virtues of thrift, as it were? Is that something else? Jews are very impressive Protestants. Max Weber would have improved. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is on this side, over here. You'll hold it? Okay, hi. Um, a couple of quick observations and, and then a question if you don't mind. On uh, Startup Nation, um, the book was very much of a promotion of an ethnicity uh, and a characteristic of entrepreneurship. It completely ignored the 1985 uh, deregulation of, uh, of industry in, uh, in Israel, which, which prompted the, uh, the startup boom there. Um, and uh, rabbis uh, Yitz Greenberg and uh, Shlomo Riskin have both in the last several years come out and talked about the change in their mind that's evolving still uh, from being Am Yisrael Chai centric, that is the people of Israel centric, and moving orthodoxy toward uh, a greater thought of being a mission to the people through perhaps tikkun olam. One of the characteristics of Jewish people, uh, typically, uh, I, I think, seen by outsiders as well, is our willingness to sort of hang our emotions and ourselves on our, on our sleeves. And I think that we're missing a great opportunity here where two of our panelists bring their own personal background very much to the fore in issues relating to money. That is, uh, Mr. Gitlin, your, your background in storming the ramparts in the 1960s speaks of a Jewish conviction to be uh, standing against the power elite and the capitalist. And uh, I, I, I've read The Enchanter, uh, Ms. Merkin. Enchanted. But, enchanted. The enchanted. Enchantment. But, but, but as, 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 a, um, as somebody in the lineage of uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch and the sibling of Ezra Merkin, I think that there's a great contrast in position for you standing in between what is a moral high stone and a person of uh, terrible controversy at this time. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might both be willing to speak to those more personal elements. Um, I would say, I mean, I'm not sure exactly I was expecting or somehow anticipating a Madoff question. I didn't think the person who would ask the Madoff question would also know about my great-great-grandfather, Samson Rafael Hirsch, who actually, in a piece I wrote for The New Yorker, founded what is thought of as modern orthodoxy. Um, I will say it is a, something I haven't completely, you know, wrapped my own head around. It is a co complicated, um, I would say I know more. I, the piece I once wrote, a uh, piece I wrote for the New Yorker about money, which was well before Madoff, I wrote a piece about money, began, I don't, I have never understood money. And it ended, it's only money, it's only everything. Um, truthfully, my, the, my brother's, um, I also wrote an op-ed about it that was much, mostly critiqued, in a few places not, um, at the, actually at the request of the Times I wrote about the case. Um, I don't know a lot about that end of the world. I mean, I am a writer. Um, as I think I wrote in Enchantment growing up, I thought my father sold chairs 
because I misunderstood, I never, did not, never could figure out till it was no longer cute what shares stood for. Um, <laughs> My, this, I'm one of six. Um, Ezra is, is a brother I've never been particularly close with, and the first I knew of the whole thing was when I opened the newspaper and there it was. And on a, just on an autobiographical level, which I don't want to so much go into, I think it has some tragic implications for my family dynamics and what went on within my family, both father-son and attitudes to money. If that says something, I hope it does. Well, I never had any doubt that when I got involved in the politics of the left that I was being Jewish although there wasn't much of this politics in my family background. Um, and at the same time, I, I was aware, I knew enough about the history of the American left to know how Jewish it had been, whether communist or socialist. And, um, and I, I had seen that as, I'd seen, uh, I, I, I was aware that how few Jews there were in America, and I knew that you could not change America by organizing Jews alone. So I was mindful quite early, and, and one thing that, you know, I was, even as I wasn't really aware how many of my colleagues in, on the left were Jewish at a certain point, I was also pleased to see that we were busting out that we were busting out of a kind of uh, compressed and, 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 and even kind of, you know, limited, uh, pinched, uh, sort of partial experience. I, I, it was important to me that we be American, that we sound American, whatever exactly. That. And it was clear very early, there was this sort of notorious episode where, where Tom Hayden and I, uh, on the SDS side, we're at a meeting with dissent editors, including Irving Howe, and um, it, it did not go well. Uh, and it, it seems pretty plain after the fact that one reason it didn't go well is that there was a cultural clash that was in part the difference between New York Jews and, and not, Auslander. Um, I mean, this is a very, this is a very tangled business. I, it was possible through most of the 60s not to pay so much attention to the question of Jewishness because it wasn't much in evidence. I mean, it was very well understood that a lot of the support for the Southern Civil Rights Movement came from Jews. Um, and that was, you know, ev that was fine with everybody. I mean, it, it, that was non-controversial in, in the movement. Uh, things get ugly later on. They get ugly uh, because the Black Panthers encouraged a certain anti-Semitic streak, which came out in uh, cartoons in the Black Panther paper, in which uh, I think uh, Zionism was at one point referred to as kosher nationalism, and there was that sort of thing going on. And there were, there were you know, this was a point at which uh, a fair number of Jews actually felt revolted by the new left and left. I mean, I even know one who went to Israel. Um, and that was, I think, not so uncommon. Um, and, and, and of course, during that period of the black nationalism, the, the, the early identification with the Palestinians sort of took the form of a bending over backward not to have anything particularly kind to say about Israel, although there were some interesting counter tendencies. I remember very well an interview that Bob Shear did in Ramparts with Fidel Castro uh, after, the, um, after the Six Day War, when, when Castro was quoted as saying, you know, th th there's all this talk about driving the Jews into the sea. That's obscene. That's genocide. You, you don't talk that way lightly. Um, Later on, you know, obviously things got more tense all the way around, and, and I, but it, it was not until myself, 
not until the early 90s, it was not until the run-up to the, uh, the first Gulf War that I actually encountered uh, anti-Semitism, which absolutely freaked me out, frankly. I encountered it on the Berkeley campus of all places. And, um, uh, you know, so I think the world has gotten much more difficult, and especially in the in the light of the, or the dark of the last uh, however many years of, of Israeli-Palestinian uh, anguish, uh, this all gets very difficult. But, you know, so all this is to say it's something to wrestle with, and I, I still do. The next question up here. Thank you. Um, I thought, I think it's interesting in a lecture that's called, or a discussion called Jews and Money, that there hasn't been much discussion about why Jews are so successful in the United States. And I was hoping you guys could touch on that a little bit. And I've noticed that you're all from the East Coast. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on how different the Jewish experience in California uh, has been from that of the East Coast. Because mo many Jews came to California right after the gold rush in the 1850s. And it was a time of turbulence, and there was really very little hierarchy, societal hierarchy. Uh, in the, in, you know, everyone was interested in getting rich. They weren't interested in excluding Jews. And as a result, Jews were able to sort of enter the mainstream immediately and be very, very successful immediately and uh, become sort of the builders of California. And of course, at that same time in New York, there are many people like the Lehmans and August Belmont who are also successful. But um, I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about what you think it is about Jews and, and their relationship to the United States have made them such a successful group of people, because I think it's pretty extraordinary. One question, I, one thought I have about, I think we were talking about it over dinner, the whole California, the earlier immigration, 1850s, that allowed prosperity fairly quickly. I also think um, brought with them a lot more assimilation than in the East Coast. This is a vast generalization, but I make it all the same. That um, my sense is like Jewish style is sort of downplayed outside of New York? That's not a direct answer to, I mean, I think one answer to Jewish achievement as Jews, I mean, are the standard, you know, the answers of, not myth, but they value education. They're, they're profession-oriented, achievement-oriented. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a, an, and I think that Jews are, I'm not going to go out on a limb a la Charles, what's his name? You know, the one who said. Murray. Um, I, Jews see, are intellectually gifted. I mean, I don't think many people would argue that. Like, they wouldn't argue a lot of Asians are intellectually gifted. I'm, not, I'm just not sure I see such a mystery to it. That the more they were allowed into colleges, law schools, medical schools, um, the less the less um, prohibitions there were, they made use of it. There's also the issue uh, that Jews uh, for centuries were forced into usury, but also other trades that did not involve being tied to the land. They were the middleman minority, and then it turned out when capitalism came around, right, all the skills that that the Jews had spent centuries cultivating because they were forced to because of anti-Semitic discrimination actually turned out to be the very skills that were incredibly valuable in a capitalist economy. And we've been uh, coasting on that ever since, I would say. No, in fact, I noticed Solo Baran in a book called Social and Religious History of the Jews, he posits a metaphysical sympathy between Jews and capitalism precisely because they're less tied to the land and it was all more portable, their skills. We also have the portable religion. Well, but I, would, I, I just want to add, you know, apropos of autobiography, uh, one of my grandfathers, uh, I, there was no money in my family. Uh, one of my grandfathers ran a fruit and vegetable store in the Bronx, and he, he had, all, I guess, these skills, these trading, buying, selling, haggling, handling skills. Uh, never made any money on it, but he, he, you know, it was his trade. I mean, let's not forget 
you know, not all the Jews became, you know, the Crockers and the Belmonts right. and, and the Bloomingdale. Or Levi Strauss. <laughs> or the what? Or Levi Strauss. Right. Or him, yeah. Uh, okay, and the last question over here. My question is for Ms. Merkin. I, I have to add, your fa grandfather was a great man, and it will be passed down in your family. My question is... Which grandfather? Oh. <laughs> Isaac Breuer? Isaac. Mine. Okay. Um, I'd like to know the media and your family with the situation, how did Jews and non-Jews react? To the specific situation of Madoff? Um... Well, you saw the, I mean, are you talking about around me? Yes, your, your contact with people, Jews and non-Jews, about the situation with Maynard. Well, I had been a staff writer at The New Yorker for six years and had moved off writing for them. They suddenly rushed to call me <laughs> to ask me what I want to write about Madoff. Um, certainly not as an expert on finance. <laughs> um, I don't know, for me, it's an, as I started to say, I mean, I'm writing a memoir myself at this moment, and the issue of, of money and my own family, which had a sort of what I would call risk of sounding like I'm using the word, like one uses Jap, a slightly waspy approach to money. It was very withheld. It wasn't meant for us. It was meant enormously for philanthropy. I think that ultimately had some strange kind of effect. But I would say most of the people who, who I knew, other than the Times asking me to write and someone else wanted me to hunt down Madoff's wife and try and find out how she was feeling or something like that. But, um, Basically, people, I, you know, I, I, within the Jewish community, the Orthodox community, which I'm not part of anymore, but all my siblings are, all five of them, there was a lot of denunci denunciation that I know. Denunciation of? Well, my brother was involved with a lot of... A lot of right, right. Things. So he stepped down, he was the president of a shul, a synagogue my father had started um, called Fifth Avenue Synagogue. He stepped down as president. Um, I think he resigned from the board of Yeshiva University. And he was also involved on the board of a school I went to called Ramaz. And I know there was a lot of letter went around about him. I mean. I didn't think it was the, the most attractive moment either. A lot of these people had done everything they could to get into the charmed Madoff circle. So it seemed to me a little bit too easy to sort of throw all the dirt in one way, but I mean, there was a lot of response to it. I think that probably wraps it up, and uh, I want to thank everyone here for coming. Uh, thank the panelists, of course. And, uh...